So, okay, thank God it's finally autumn. I'm not a summer girly at all. I hate it. Um, that's why I live in Canada. <laughs> This summer was a really weird one. I feel like it was either a heat wave or a thunderstorm. And then the three days that it was actually nice, sunny weather, I was sick. So what I usually consider my season to grab all of my really giant hardcovers and go out into the park and just read on a picnic blanket with my snacks until the sun goes down was thwarted. So I did read some really good books though. I will tell you about them, but it was just, it's another summer where I did not read War and Peace. And now I think reading War and Peace throughout an entire summer is my white whale. And once I accomplish that, I think I will lose purpose in life. So maybe it's a good thing that I didn't read it this summer. So the first book that I read this summer was I Want to Die, But I Want to Eat Tikbaki by Bak Sihi. I read the audiobook version of this. It's about a young woman who documents her experience going to therapy. She has dysthymia or mild depression, and she basically transcribes her dialogue with her therapist. I didn't really enjoy this very much. I, I've been to therapy. I know how CBT works, and so it felt very surface level to me. There are, there are a few micro essays in the book that really kind of reflect on this experience and do a lot more unpacking of the experience itself rather than just being this one person's experience figuring out her harmful thought patterns and developing coping mechanisms and i thought those micro essays were really cool and i would have liked to see more of that that being said my understanding is that this book does really appeal to people who like individuals and cultures where these things aren't talked about very much in my circles it is, and so it's just, it didn't feel new or impactful to me, but I understand how it would be to others. So if you think that would be interesting to you, definitely go check it out. Next up, I read something with a lot of dust on the dust jacket. I read Landscapes by Christine Lai next. I had not heard, and I still haven't heard really many people talking about this book but I saw it on the table in my local bookstore and I looked at the dust jacket, I read the cover and I thought, I think this is written for me. <laughs> and having read it, I think I really enjoyed it. So it's a very quiet apocalypse book. And I loved that. It's about what happens when the English countryside starts drying out due to drought and heat waves and it's about this decaying country house where this woman is an archivist. She once lived there as a young woman. She's coming back decades later to move out all of the art that is still intact because the house is literally falling apart. And there's absolutely beautiful descriptions of art and landscape. And oh my God, it was stunning. And yeah, it's about, you know, past memories and past times coming back to haunt you. The characters are really nuanced and really interesting. It was really good. It's by a Canadian author. This is her debut novel. Yes. And I am so excited to see what she does next. Next up, I read just really quickly James Baldwin's Dark Days. It's a collection of some of his essays, um, including um, Dark Days. Yeah, I mean, it's Baldwin. It's essays on race and violence in the US, um, the personal and the political. I felt that this was still really incisive and topical today, even though we've adopted a lot of Baldwin's language and ideas into current activism. His writing is beautiful and still resonates today. Next up, I read Flights by Olga Tokarczyk. I read the audiobook of this and I need to stop reading audiobooks of fiction. I can't follow them. I don't know exactly what it is. I can really follow nonfiction well. As soon as it's fiction, I no, no information gets absorbed. I really have to concentrate um, to figure out what I'm hearing. So I think one day I will reread Flights in a paper version. I mean, I loved it. It was still beautiful. I read Tokarczuk's um, Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. 
loved it. I really want to pick up the books of Jacob. It's just large. So it's a short story collection. Altogether, we get this overview of what it means to be traveling and moving through time. It was really cool. Any book about time is going to get me good. And I just think Tkarczyk's prose is wonderful. And yeah, super immersive, even though I can't handle audiobooks about fiction. So next up, I read Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. This is a recommendation from my grandma. So thank you, grandma. Um, she's a big reader and I love talking to her about books. So I think a really big part of the book for me and a big selling point is that a lot of it is narrated by this very intelligent human consciousness level uh, sentient dog and I loved that. It felt kind of out of place but also not really <laughs> uh, because what is this book about? It's about this scientist in the 60s who's very limited in her ability to make her scientific discoveries because of the fact that she's a woman. She can't really get a job as a working scientist, so she ends up getting this job as like a cooking show host uh, and uses that to radicalize housewives into understanding the science behind cooking. And so I think, I think the book wasn't really written for me, um, and that's okay. It's not a story that I needed, but I see how it works for a lot of people. I actually really enjoyed the characters. It was just the premise I didn't really connect to. So the more we had, so the more interiority we had of each of the different characters, including the talking dog, the more I liked it. But once we were getting into the cooking show stuff, I was just not there. And then I read Lester by Raven Leilani. This was amazing. A lot of people have talked about this one. came out a couple of years ago and I mean it's great. It's about a young woman who's working unfulfilling jobs and then she meets this man who's in an open marriage and yeah as she gets into this relationship she gets into the whole family. There's so much packed Look how, look how small this book is. There's so much packed in here. Fantastic commentary about art and race and gender, relationships, checking my notes, intimacy, like, wow, <laughs> it was so good. All right, next I read a weird one. This is the H of H playbook by Ann Carson. She's done it again. I love Ann Carson. I understand maybe generously maybe 60% of what she's getting at um, but still obsessed so it's like it's a multimedia poetry book like a scrapbook I'll show you what I mean hold on it's like a scrapbook sketchbook kind of thing um, like <laughs> what's going on here uh, if you know Ann Carson's books you know this isn't like totally new for like like the ripped page here like what can you I don't know if this is actually in frame um this took me like you know a sitting to read so yeah poetry sketchbook vibes um it's a retelling of Euripides Eur Euripides's Heracles it was about like masculinity and violence and war and uh super weird loved after that i read the decline and fall of the chatty empire by john emil vincent um this was published by mcgill queen's university press a local academic press and they also have a poetry imprint it's an apillion which is a classical poetic form epic like i think it's like a mini epic kind of I looked it up and then I forgot. So through this classical poetic form of the Apillion, we follow the journey towards self-fulfillment of Chatty Cathy, the doll from the 60s, I want to say, right around Barbie time. Um, and yeah, I mean, you can't help but draw the comparison to the new Barbie movie because they came out like around the same time. 
I don't know if, I don't think that was the intention here. I guess John and Mill had the same idea at the same time. Cool poems, cool language, um, really funky form that I found very interesting, but I don't know if I'm really itching to reread it soon. After that, I read Wishful Drinking by Carrie Fisher, read the audiobook of this, love the audiobooks of Carrie Fisher's books because she does the reading and she's very funny. This book was about her upbringing and her struggles with addiction and I don't think I loved it as much as The Princess Diaries. I read The Princess Diaries last year, I think, and I really liked that one, which has the cool framing device of Carrie Fisher finding her diaries from when she was on the set of Star Wars and revisiting those and recontextualizing them decades on. And I found that Wishful Drinking, which I'm pretty sure came beforehand, touched on a lot of the same points and a lot of the same milestones in her life and in her career, but just not through an interesting framing device. And so I think I felt that that was lacking, but I don't think I would have felt that if I hadn't read The Princess Diarist already. So I wish I had read this and then The Princess Diarist. Next up, I read some more poems. I read Aboutness by Imar Leffen, and this was super weird. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna try to show you I marked this one up so it's hard to show you exactly, but yeah, this one really plays with the visual aspects of poetry. Um, yep, we've got all of these. And instead of conventional line breaks, we have the slash in the text, which I learned is called a virgule. And we've got a lot of end notes that are referenced in these sort of long parts of the poem. And it takes you to the end of the book where there's more poems. This was super fun. This was a very meta book about the process of producing art. And yeah, we go across all different time periods and themes and I don't know. <laughs> We go a little bit all over the place and I thought it was really cool. I had a, I had a really good time reading it. Um, I underlined a whole lot. I dog-eared so many pages. Um, I even dog-eared like I wanted both pages, both sides of the page dog-eared and so I even double dog-eared this one. Um, I have sticky tabs. I have them and I still dog-ear books, I'm sorry. I really enjoyed it. I would love to revisit it soon. Um, also published by Mako Queens University Press. Okay, next up is a book that really got the literary fiction gals excited this summer. Um, just also, look at the... It just looks so cool, right? Anyway, Biography of X by Catherine Lacey is a novel. Um, okay, it's a fictional biography of a late artist written by her wife and there's more and it's set in an alternate reality where in the mid-century i think after world war ii the usa was split into different territories notably resulting in the southern territory being um a theocracy like a fascist theocracy where you know no information gets in or out okay that's the premise and so it's this really cool, it's so cool. I, I don't know what else it could be compared to. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. It's about grief and the role of the artist, the role of the lover, the strengths and weaknesses of cultural and political commentary. Like the end kind of took me on a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a dip and then it came back up again for me. I wasn't sure where we were going with it, and then I finished the last few chapters and went, oh, okay, I like it. So yeah, very cool. Cameos by a ton of artists and cultural theorists um, saying like fictional things, like commenting on the Southern Territory or on X, which obviously have not been said because it's fiction, but the people that are quoted in the biography are often real. 
and I just thought that was pretty cool. I'll definitely be picking up Pew by the same author. Um, I had seen it around, I wasn't too sure about it, but after reading this, absolutely will be checking it out. And I think it deals with a lot of the same themes, and possibly is set in the same alternate reality with the Southern Territory, so that's cool. So this is Theophylin, A Poetic Migration by Aaron Moore, or, hold on, Theophylin, An Aporetic Migration via the Modernisms of Rukeyser Bishop Grimke, in parentheses, de Castro Vallejo, close parentheses, um, featuring a poet alter ego by the name of Eliza Sampedrian. Published by House of Anansi, a very lovely Canadian independent press. Yeah, it looks like I read three formally super weird books in a row. Um, and I love that. Give me, give me more of these formally very unconventional experimental books. This is a poetry book. It's, it's half poem, half essay. I don't know if you could comfortably categorize it. Hold on, I wrote this down. We are examining the poetics of asthma via femininity, translation, and queerness, and a group of modernist poets featuring a mysterious poet alter ego who interferes in the assemblage of the book. So that sounds like it is a lot, and it is a lot. Um, especially, it's, it's not a very large book. It's large for a book of poetry. But yeah, if you're into disability studies, queer studies, um, poetics in general, I think this is a really, really cool read. Just a fun one to read the full title of. Just whip that out in conversation. If you can remember it, because I can't. I would definitely revisit it. It would be an endeavor, but I would love to revisit it and uh, unpack it a little bit more in detail. Because I was reading this for a review, so I had to go a little bit quickly, but I would love to just sort of sit with this for a long time. Next up I read My Body by Emily Ratajkowski. I read the audiobook version and I thought it was really cool. Um, I don't have a lot of really extensive thoughts on this. I don't listen to audiobooks that often. Um, I know there are some people who are super well versed in sort of the discourse of audiobooks, but um, there were parts where she was reading, it was read by Emily Ratajkowski and there were parts where she would get very emotional and her voice would be breaking while she was reading. And I thought that was really cool. I thought that was an interesting touch. Um, and definitely made me feel even more emotional than the content was already. So it's a, it's a collection of essays by Emily Ratajkowski. The essays range in different topics from like gender, um, beauty, love, family. I kind of loved it. Um, it was very open, very honest. Um, it was really interesting to get a glance behind the scenes of a figure who we often think of as sort of not a real person. And I really enjoyed the chapter or the essay on Blurred Lines. I remember that discourse when that music video came out and I thought her narrative of what happened behind the scenes and her changing views over time on what happened and the reception to that music video. I thought that was really cool. I really liked that essay. I found it super insightful and a perspective that only she can have. A lot of her essays were on topics that have been discussed at length. Um, you know, everybody has their own approach to topics obviously. Definitely the one on Blurred Lines stood out to me. I'd recommend reading that one at least if you don't read all of them. Um, next I read Continuum by Ivana Baranova. Oh, this isn't actually the cover. This is an advanced copy. I will show what the cover looks like here. So this book, this is a book of poems, really short poems, like about consciousness and time. I did find a lot of the poems a little too opaque and vague where I felt like I couldn't get to the meaning of a lot of what the speaker was saying without doing a lot of imaginative work on my end. And so I often find that a little difficult, 
it's definitely not for everybody. I find that I prefer really grounded imagery um, rather than the big abstract phrases where I'm like, I don't know that I know what you're talking about, but oh my God, some of the titles and some of the phrases, like some incredible turns of phrase in this book. Cutting dusk is for anyone whose likeness cradles subtle wonders. Do I see yet? Forgiveness is memory mountain. Desktop image scavenged, not so much exalted, but exactly grace. Like, you know what I mean? It's not a sentence. I don't really know where that thought begins and ends, but that can be very cool to interpret. Then I've got a chat book here, Bodies Like Gardens by Selena Wiener, uh, who's a friend and colleague of mine. And this was really nice. I really liked a lot of the lines here. Like, it's about how we embody nature through our emotional and historical struggles. It's a really great bite-sized piece. I love, love chat books. Next up is another friend and colleague's book, We Have Never Lived on Earth by Kasia Van Skyk. So this is a short story collection, but it can also be read as a novel. It follows this one character, this young woman who is living in our current ecological crisis and her travels and meeting new people. And so you can read the different stories as standalone stories, or you can read it all the way through. I thought that was very cool. The prose in here is stunning. The characters are really interesting. And this was recently longlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, which is one of the biggest literary awards in Canada. I listened to The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. Uh, I think this is actually my first Didion and I really liked it. So we follow the year following the death of Joan Didion's husband. She's reflecting on her grief and her work and it's really moving and I really look forward to reading her other books. I have Slouching Toward Bethlehem, so I might read that next. And then I have one last book. I technically read this in autumn, but I really want to talk about it now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to. Um, I make the rules. It's my channel. This is Fane by Anne-Marie MacDonald. Um, Anne-Marie MacDonald is a Canadian author. Um, but this is set on the border between England and Scotland um, at, at an estate called Fane. It's Fane. Uh, so we've got moors and haunted paintings and the serious people who come in and out of our main character's life. It's set in the late-ish 19th century, yeah, Victorian period, and it follows this young girl who lives at Fane. She's an only child, so there's, you know, that, so there's that tension of who will inherit Fane um, because she cannot because she is a girl. And she's a young, I need to stop holding this, this is a heavy book. <laughs> Our main character is a young scholar and she wants to go to university, but again, she's a girl and she's also kept inside the walls of fame. She's never really left the estate because she has a condition. We don't really know what this condition is. So yeah, that's where we start out. What is this condition? Will she be able to pursue her academic interests? What will happen to Fane? Um, and that's kind of, all I can tell you without spoiling like kind of one of the big twists, I think I know very clearly where I figured out what was going on. Um, yeah, so <laughs> exactly on page 200, we get part two. And the first part, the 200 pages, it's a bit of it's a bit slow. You don't really know what's really going on because you're coming from the point of view of this young girl who clearly has not been given all of the information that she needs. And as clues slowly start dropping on what's really going on at Fane, as soon as you realize, oh, I see what this book is, or at least for me. This was my experience. And then part two hits, and we get blasted back to the past. 
we meet Charlotte's mother and we're meeting her as a young girl, we skip to an entirely different plot, um, like a Regency courtship plot. <laughs> and it was so frustrating, but so good, because um, I will tell you, I spent, so like I, I told you, I got to part two at page 200. I've been reading this part for like a month or so. I read the remaining 500 pages in one sitting or kind of one sitting. Um, I started at like 8 p.m., read until 4 a.m., decided I should sleep a little bit, and then woke up the next day and finished. Um, I could not put it down. I kept saying like, okay, when we get back to this time period, I'll stop. But no, it just kept getting more exciting. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't want to tell you what the condition is. Um, and to tell you my favorite parts would be to reveal what it is. I went on a journey with this book. Um, the book itself is a whole journey. It's actually extremely Dickensian. Um, where you get so many different characters and they're in the end all connected in these really weird ways um, and like people coming back from the past people you think are dead are not dead um, it's wacky it's like about gender and science and magic um, the moors <laughs> there's like a weird hermit guy who lives on the moors and he's like this weird magical mysterious being and then he turns out to be this really oh and i'd say it's really worth the payoff i once you know you get well into it and you kind of figure out what the actual story is um i was wondering where are we gonna go with this and then the last chapters were really actually very good deals with a lot of topics of queerness and sexuality um, and what gender is in really interesting ways that I've not seen tackled very often. I'm starting to get like weird and jittery about it. Um, it was so cool. So yeah, I finished that and then went to pick up Anne Marie McDonald's other book, Fall on Your Knees, um, which I don't know much about, but I trust her. Um, it's about four sisters in the first half of the 20th century from Nova Scotia to New York. I'm down. <laughs> I picked this one up. I picked up Fane because I love, as you saw with the first book in this wrap up, I really love country house stories um, and I really love the Moors as this setting and like almost a, a person. If you're a fan of the Brontes and Dickens and wish there was more queerness, I got the book for you. It's, it's fame. Check it out. Um, yeah, this, this is sticking with me for a while. I am very excited by it. And I have told everybody I know to go read it so that I can talk to somebody about it. Fame. So I'm putting this video out a little bit late. We are well into autumn. I have already found a few new favorite books already in this first few weeks of autumn, and I cannot wait to tell you about them and more in December. So let me know if you've read any of these, what you thought of them, if you have, um, and otherwise what you're getting up to in autumn, what you're planning on reading, what you're planning on doing. Let me know. See ya.